Welcome everybody to this week's Design at Large seminar. Uh, I wanted to start out today by thanking Jackie in the back who does all of the logistical work that makes this seminar possible. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> and uh, so the fact that all of the speakers actually show up and have a place to stay is because of her. And this week's speaker is Darren Gurgle. Um, I really like Darren's research. I, I really like reading his papers. He's an eminently clear thinker. Uh, and as many of you who are also taking my graduate class know, you know, writing eminently clear papers is a really hard thing to do. And uh, and I've just always I've always liked Darren's work, and, and I think you'll see why in his talk today. He's worked for a number of years on collaboration and online environments, which I think is one of the most important problems to be tackling right now. It's ubiquitous in different forms. And he's worked both on small group collaboration, uh, things like video conferencing, and what are the differences between remote and co-located work. Uh, he's also done a lot of work more recently, especially on large online collaboration. And that he, that's what he's going to be talking about today. He's currently an associate professor at Northwestern uh, in the communication department, where he helps lead the technology and social behavior program. And so if those of you are interested in heading to graduate school, it's a good program to think about. It's a great program to think about. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Darren. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Thanks for uh, having me out here. It's, it's great to, to be here. I've um, been reading and following work from UCSD for a really long time, and uh, it's great to have the opportunity to, to talk here and, and to enjoy your nice weather, because when I left Chicago, it was uh, 40 degrees, cloudy, and uh, a little bit rainy. But that only happens for one day. It, the rest of the year, it's like, like this, so feel free to apply and come on out to my <laughs> <lesson>. <laughs> Um, so the work that I want to present today, uh, it really stems from a larger project in my lab that we've been working on lately. Where we're, what we're trying to do is to mine uh, and understand um, data from these large-scale global user-generated uh, content repositories. Uh, and then we want to take that information and leverage it to develop new types of technologies. And for today's talk, I'm going to focus on work we've been doing really in the last couple of years um, that focuses particularly on how language and language-based um, cultures influence the form of the information that gets put into these repositories and how that can ultimately be consumed and used by technologies and also provide new ways of designing around that. Um, so Wikipedia uh, is what I want to focus on here. And you might be sighing now. I normally I hear the Ugh, Wikipedia talk, another Wikipedia talk. Uh, hopefully that won't happen here. I think this is a little more exciting than the, the typical talk. Wikipedia talks. Awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so the the thing about Wikipedia is I, I would argue that it's actually a re one of our most important um, resources right now, information reports, resources. And I don't mean this in a scholarly way. It's not where we go to read our sort of most, our deepest sort of journal kind of articles. But it's a place where everybody goes to, uh, where lots of people go to from all around the world for sort of their first exposure to a piece of information, for their first kind of thing to learn about some historical event, some person, some algorithm even. We, we tend to go to Wikipedia a lot and get kind of that cursory sort of overview of it. And I think in this way, it serves a, a really critical component and a source of information for a lot of people around the world. And as a result of this, uh, Wikipedia has been investigated by a lot of different researchers. I think in part because of its prominence, because of the the availability of it. It's getting explored by a lot of different uh, researchers. And they've looked at things like coordination and collaboration processes that happen uh, in these environments. How do we get people to participate and contribute to, to Wikipedia? How do we maintain that community over time? Uh, and then there's been studies that look at more of the information as almost an artifact. So things like topical coverage and biases that are in the information that's presented. It's primarily white males from the age of 20 to 30 that are putting in the content. What does that mean for the information that's being put in and the representations that we have? Uh, a number of studies that, that have been looking at Wikipedia uh, on those areas. Um, another thing is then, too, Wikipedia has become really important in the last few years as the brains of a lot of AI and natural language processing algorithms. Right? So a second thing that's happening is things like explicit semantic analysis, or Dan Weld and his group up at UW are doing things like information arbitrage, where they're trying to do translation systems that are uh, bringing um, information across different language editions. Uh, and so uh, the basis of that is often that it's working on a, a language version of Wikipedia and the data structures that are kind of encapsulated there. So the information is a really important repository for these AI and NLP uh, applications. Um, yeah, one of the things that we've been critiquing in, in our work and that we've been focusing on is that almost all of this work has been done exclusively on the English version of Wikipedia. Yet there exists over 275 different language editions of Wikipedia. 
So we have this huge, a massive, some would argue parallel or maybe not so parallel corpus of all of this stuff, different information across all of these different environments. Um, and I would argue that um, as a result uh, of the focus on the English Wikipedia, uh, and this is somewhat implicit and I would argue problematic, um, an assumption of that prior work is that people from different parts of the world that speak um, different languages um, have or should essentially have access to the same information. Um, they participate and coordinate in similar ways. Uh, and basically that by just studying the English version, we're over attributing these, these to other cultures and other environments and other languages and other repositories. Right? And so I think this is a, a critical challenge that we need to be thinking about when we both build and understand these systems and build new technologies based off of them. Um, why else is this important? And to sort of frame this a little bit in this sort of design at large context, um, I think there's things we need to be thinking about when we're working in these large scale user generated repository environments uh, and the access that people have to these uh, environments. So equal information access is something that's really critically important when we're starting to think about designing for global environments. Right? So if language, language is a fracturing effect. If you don't speak a language, you can't get access to that information. So what does it mean to have this really prominent repository in English when we can't access it from if we only speak French or German or, or some other uh, language? Um, second, we want to think about in our systems ways to design and retain the potentially diverse perspectives that we have uh, and really provide truly global coverage across all of this information. And this is really important if, this, if the goal of Wikipedia is to represent all of the world's knowledge. Right? We don't just want the Western English view of the world's knowledge. We want a global representation of that. <coughs> and then finally, it's something I think is becoming really important now and that people are starting to talk about a lot, both computer scientists and social scientists, is this idea that we need to have a deeper, better understanding of algorithmic biases uh, and what the role of these might play in the information that gets structured, its representation, and ultimately influences its consumption. So if we think about something like relatedness of entities, hello? Uh, if we think about relatedness of entities in two different languages, um, and they come, they come through, and that has to do with the ranking of the structuring of the information. Um, we could be putting information out there, like imagine we do a search and we get a listing of uh, a response of all the different things that are related to that. The way they're structured and the way they're ordered um, can influence our, our subsequent consumption and the formulation that we have about a space or an environment that we're interested in reading about. Okay. Um, and so to do this, I think we need new perspectives, new methods, and new tools. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about today. So we've been working over the past few years. You know where that's coming from? Sorry to interrupt that, everybody. That's OK. Got it. I don't think I did anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you blocked the slide, but that's OK. So, um, so for the last few years, we've, I, want to do three, <laughs> I want to do three things in this talk. I'm just going to keep going, and you can yeah, yeah, go more that. Um, we want to develop new ways to study the diversity uh, um, coverage uh, of diversity across different language editions of Wikipedia. So we want to try to understand to what extent diversity exists in these different language editions. Um, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to demonstrate what effects of this coverage bias or potential coverage biases, I've given a little bit of a lead into what I think we're going to find in the first part, might have on end user technologies. And then I want to talk in the third part about something we've been, I've been really sort of adamant in our lab about doing, which is not to just sort of poo-poo this and say, oh, this is, you know, terrible problems that we have, but actually provide um, some new ways of thinking about developing technologies that make use of these diversity representations and present them in, in new forms and new novel technologies. And so I'm going to present a system we built called Omnipedia to show how we've been working on that. Okay. So the beginning research question that we had was just to even assess, nobody really knew at the time, what extent the diversity exists among these different Wikipedia language editions. And to simplify this, I'm going to think about um, two different kind of hypotheses we could have in this space. So the global consensus perspective, or the global consensus hypothesis, is really the idea that every language's encyclopedic world knowledge um, has roughly the same set of concepts, uh, and it presents that information in roughly the same way, regardless of language. And this is actually an implicit assumption in a lot of our technological systems that do things like information arbitrage or calculate semantic relatedness um, and then translate afterwards. Right? So they, they think if they use the basis of a of a repository, it'll have the same kind of result uh, coming out of it. The opposite of this, or sort of the other end of the extreme, is what I'm going to call the global diversity uh, hypothesis. And this is that the information contained in these repositories, whether it's English or Chinese or Swedish or whatever, is very, very different. Right? We expect very different information and different relations amongst uh, this, the, these data. 
And so this is, these are two extremes. The truth is obviously probably somewhere in the middle. Um, but I want to set this up as uh, kind of our understanding going forward. And it's important to say that a lot of computer science implicitly assumes this in the way that it works. Almost every social scientist implicitly assumes this in the way that we culturally represent and, and um, establish and think about and have knowledge. right? So we're kind of at odds between those two. And that's something that I think is, for me, just sort of an interesting problem to, to have. <laughs> So a little bit of uh, jargon before we move forward. I'm going to talk about um, looking at these Wikipedia pages. And I'm going to talk about thinking about diversity at two different levels. Um, what we call the concept level, which is does the page exist? Think of this as the page title. So here we have the page of, uh, on chocolate in the English Wikipedia and the page on chocolate in the German Wikipedia. So if the page exists, we're talking about this as the article topic or the concept level. Um, and then what I would refer to as the subconcept level or the body the content that's being written about each of those. And we can have diversity of what's being represented at these two levels. Okay. So for the first study, uh, what we were focusing on was concept level diversity. Do these different pages exist across the languages? Uh, and to do this, we have a, a rather large corpus that we pulled together. So we had 25 different language editions that we worked on. And this was around a 2009, end of 2009, beginning of 2010 data dump. Um, so we had 25 language editions, about 18 million articles, uh, and about a billion links that we were working on and processing across these language editions. Um, English was the largest of these uh, dumps, and it was 4 million articles at the time and around 295 million links. Uh, Hebrew was the smallest. It was only 142,000 pages and only 10 million links. Right? So even our smallest uh, is still pretty, pretty large. <laughs> but to assess the, the uh, diversity that's existing, um, we need a methodology here. And we need to be able to develop a way of aligning pages in different languages to, to know that they're sort of talking about or meaning the same thing. Uh, and so we want to go from a page to something like this. We want to think about it as, as a universal concept. Uh, and this is the concept for what in English we refer to as chocolate. And so we have this idea of a, of a concept. Uh, and we want to get to a universal concept, which is here's the, uh, this notion that we know of in English as chocolate. And it's also known as chocolade in, in German. And, um, chocolate in French, and I have, we study what we don't understand, which is why my, my language pronunciations are pretty terrible on these things, but feel free to correct me if you like. Um, but we want to get to this, this case where we have a universal uh, concept that's a language neutral representation of the, of the concept that we're interested in. Uh, and one of the things that we do to do this is we harvest um, what's uh, on Wikipedia are known as interlanguage links. So there's a gigantic interlanguage link graph in Wikipedia. So let's imagine the, the representation. You have a given language. You have all the articles and their links as a big graph. You then have these in multiple languages. And the interlanguage links basically tie these different graphs together. Right? So we're going to be making use of these. And so if you go to any Wikipedia page and you look down the left-hand side, you'll see the different languages. These are links, interlanguage links that have been put in by the, the user community that say this page in chocolate is the same as this other page in this other language. Okay. <laughs> so what this allows us to do, and I think one of the reasons um, this is kind of a powerful approach to think about what we call hyperlingual approaches, which are to think about multiple languages at once as opposed to in a pairwise fashion, is it allows us to construct these universal uh, concept IDs. So here we have um, essentially, this is kind of a, a fake example because chocolate's actually very well, uh, very well linked across languages. But we have chocolate in English, uh, in Danish, in Hebrew, uh, and Spanish. And what we see is we have these kind of linked together into a concept because of the interlanguage linking. Uh, and it allows us to do things like identify missing links. Right? So here the chocolate page in Spanish and the chocolate page in English don't have an explicit link, but we know that one should exist. And so it helps out for that. Uh, in our actual recovery. So when we compare this to other approaches to detect missing links, um, this approach actually works really well because we're harvesting information from multiple languages at once. Um, and so this missing link challenge uh, was one of the major challenges we had here. But it's helped in part by this interlanguage link approach. Uh, and we have, I'm not going to go into the evaluations in detail, but basically there's a gold standard. And we, and we capture about 96% of the links uh, that were in that gold standard. Uh, and we do about as well on a wikification approach is where we strip out all the links and then we test if we can refine them again as the, the single language wikification uh, algorithms do as well. So we're, we're kind of on par with the state of the art, only going into a hyperlingual space. The second major challenge, and I think this is a kind of an interesting one and, and an important one, is what's called the conceptual drift challenge. Uh, and the other thing that we noticed when we started to do this work is assessment becomes really hard. We can't just assess 
these in the same way that you can do with a single language speaker. We're doing hyperlingual. We want to know the mapping between English and French, but we also want to know French to German, German to Chinese, Chinese to English. It becomes a really big problem. And so the way of using human evaluation becomes really taxed. Right, if we want to test for the, for the clarity of, of these concepts. But we still did a form of bilingual human evaluation here where we found that less than 5% of the links were missing in this approach, and, and we had almost zero incorrect links. So we're not gathering extra pieces. But conceptual drift um, is the side effect of this interlanguage link graft, and it causes um, this, this problem that we have to remedy. So I'm going to talk through that a little bit. So the idea with conceptual drift, it really stems from this well-known finding in cognitive science that the boundaries of concepts vary a lot by language uh, and by different language cultures and language groups. <coughs> and you can think of this um, as the equivalent of kind of a semantic version of the game telephone. So does everybody know that game telephone? So if I was to go up and whisper to John San Diego, and then he would whisper all the way through the crowd, and then it would kind of come back to me, it would be you know change into sort of man and Pedro, and then um, how'd your day go by the time it gets back to me, right? So, so this notion of telephone is that you have this sort of drift in this movement as you're moving through people. We have the same form and a kind of a semantic form happening through the language graph. So an example here uh, that'll make this pretty clear in a pretty egregious case, we have river and canal are two different pages in English. Their river links to a page in German, but that same German page links to canal in English. So we're starting to, you're beginning to see the problem here. Now, when we go into a hyperlingual space, this propagates so we have French that links canal to canyon, and we get into a bunch of other languages. And by the time we end up with this huge clustered concept that puts trench warfare, rain gutter, in the same concept as river and canal. Right? And so this is a problem. Some of the more egregious cases, um, we have women gets put into the same concept as marriage. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, men don't. Um, <laughs> I think we have another case where we have uh, secondary school gets grouped into the same concept as uh, diplomacy, right? And so these are really kinds of odd things, but they're happening because you're moving through these different, this different language space. So algorithmically, this is a really hard challenge for us compared to typical approaches, which are only either bilingual or, or working on a single language. Um, so we have uh, an algorithm called conceptual line, and it really works with major, two major parameters. Uh, the first one, it just limits the number of edges that a given language can point to a same article in another language. And the second thing is what we call minlangs, which is that we require a certain percentage of those links to occur in more than one language. Right? So we can, these are parameters that we can tune. And then this way, we can actually cut up the graph, and we get a better representation. So here, we're OK with river and canal being in the same concept. Um, but we can exclude some of the more egregious cases. So we have to do a lot of this work in order to, to get kind of an accurate universal concept. But once we do that, we have a way of going from these pages in these different Wikipedia editions to this universal concept. Right? <coughs> and after we parsed all 25 database dumps and we aligned over 11 million articles uh, to their corresponding concepts, what did we find? So we found that, in fact, the typical concept looked nothing like this. Chocolate is this sort of hyperlingual concept that's a global concept that everyone talks about. But in fact, it was much more the case that it looked like this. Um, Rogenmark, which is a, a market in Munster, Germany, and it was a single language concept. We find that the vast, vast proportion of the concepts across all of these different language editions are single language concepts. Right? So this is showing us that there's a great deal of diversity in the information that's being represented. And here's a, just a graph on the x-axis. We have the number of languages, so, and they're binned. And so this is single language edition uh, concepts. And then all the way out here in the tail are concepts that appear in all 25 languages. And there's some out here, but it's a really small number. Less than one-tenth of 1% exist in these top 25 language editions of Wikipedia. So I think this is one way to show that we have a great deal of diversity that's being represented in these different, no in these different knowledge repositories. Um, and we can cut this several different ways. We can think of looking at just the smallest three Wikipedias. And even in just comparing those, we see that about 86% of the concepts are single language. And 5% of the concepts exist in all three. Yep. So um, I want to ask a thorny theoretical question without derailing things too much. OK. Is, um, people often ask things like, what's the Harvard of Japan? Mm -hmm. and so you could pick a university in Japan. And the page about that university is kind of like the English page about Harvard. That's probably not a great example, but you can see how um, there are 
topics that will be, I mean, it's a, it's a fuzzy slope of what's the same concept or not. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so this, this is something that um, we're relying on the community's assessment of what are the same topics at some level. Um, and this is why it's useful to get kind of what we try to do is to get sort of a more universal agreement on some of those kinds of things where we would separate them, right? So you know, the university one is an interesting case because I, I think most people in the world would say it's not. Harvard's not, or Michigan's not the Harvard of the West or whatever they like to claim they are. Um, but if you're in Ann Arbor, that might actually be the case, right? And so this is, I think, just a, a much more nuanced um, variant of what I want to talk about, which is this, this differential representation depending on community and culture. Uh, and it's something that we tend to wipe out, and I'm arguing that we need to come up with methods to retain this, although you've just said that maybe we've gone a little too far uh, in, the, in the other extreme. Yeah. Um, yep. I have a question about the previous graph. Yes. The one before this one. Is this the average number? This is the total number across the whole corpus, yeah. So this is 7 million concepts here. Right. Um, now, one thing that you might say when you look at this is, um, well, that's OK, but really what's happening is, and we refer to this as the English as superset corollary, all of those single language edition ones are just from English, because English is so much bigger than some of these other uh, cases. right? So you could argue that, that this is the case. Um, but what we see when we actually look at these in, in a pairwise fashion is that it's actually not the case. So in comparing English and German, two of the largest Wikipedia editions, we see that almost 50% of the German concepts don't appear in English. Uh, and we can go through pairwise and look at a bunch of different language editions this way. And we still see, even uh, assuming um, size differentials, there's still a great amount of information in the smaller languages that's not appearing in the larger languages. So it's not just a case that there hasn't been an evolution or it hasn't been written up yet. Yep. Do you have any, any good feeling about how much is missing translation and how, how much is actually a concept that doesn't exist? How much is missing translation? Yeah, so say more. Have, if you have something that is, uh, you know, actually exists in another language, but nobody did the translation. Ah, I see. Yeah, so that's that's an interesting case. Um, I would argue that translation is kind of a bad thing if it's not recontextualized. Um, but there's it's the communities that are making the determination as to what content kind of belongs in these different scenarios. Um, one thing that we have seen is we've actually seen a fair amount of people doing sort of straight translations. And when we look more qualitatively at the data, people coming in and removing it. Right? So the community is deciding that's not something that we want in this Wikipedia, and probably because of the way it's been contextualized. But yeah, I don't have a good indication of like what is, I mean, you're asking a much deeper question, I think, which is like, what are the real, true world concepts that are out there? And how could they be represented? Yeah, John. Kind of, so kind of a related question, do you have any sense of on the one hand, there are things like chocolate, your example, or water, or you know, femininity, or something that really is more like a concept. And then there are a bunch of things that are like your example about the market, where you would kind of expect that the big cities might be represented in different languages, but mm -hmm. little villages and people that are famous in a little tiny area might be only in that language, mm -hmm. or maybe sports figures there are some that would be kind of known around the world. Global and like, regional. This is the, the best golfer that ever emerged from Liechtenstein. You know? yep. So Liechtenstein's going to have that. But and that's important to the people of Liechtenstein. Yeah, Liechtenstein yes, right? exactly. So I'm going to get to that, actually, because that's, okay. that's one of the things that we, we try to uncover through this data mining is the degree to which that's happening. Yeah. Um, but so just at this at sort of page existence level, um, I think we see uh, not much support for this, this global consensus idea, and actually quite a bit of diversity present in the, in the data. So hopefully I've at least convinced you of that, looking at the, the corpus as it currently stands. Um, but there was definitely a small percentage of what I would call global concepts that existed. Uh, and it's a little depressing when we think about this as to what the global concepts are. And this is actually a nicer list probably than I should be presenting. But we have the collection of them that people are interested in. Um, sports stars, uh, pop stars are pretty common. Um, footballers of, of various large European clubs are, are quite global concepts. Um, things like Sarah Palin, things like the Nobel Prize. Um, anybody know what this is? It's a computer science department, not a chemistry department. <laughs> Caffeine, <laughs> the next, yeah, the closest one, um, right? So, so there's a, a number of kind of global concepts, but the thing that you should be thinking is, well, even if these exist in all the languages, that doesn't necessarily mean they're represented and they're talked about in the same way. Sarah Palin's page might look really different in France uh, versus, or in French, than it would in the English one, for instance. Right. So the next step we want to do is we want to assess, uh, come up with a, a method for assessing sub-concept level diversity. 
So here we're going to assume that we have these pages that they exist in the different languages, and we want to look at the details of the information and how it's different. Right? So we have a corpus of 217,000 same concept pairs that we draw from our global concepts list. And we want to determine the average diversity between any two pages, describing that same concept in two different languages. And so the way that we do this is we take advantage of a technique developed by Adafra and Dereich uh, that essentially uses a bag of links approach. And what we're doing is we're going through the page, we pick out all of the different links, and we use these as essentially a heuristic representation of the content of the page. Right? So here we see that when we pull these from chocolate, we see in Mexico, Mesoamerica, Aztec, cocoa butter, white chocolate eggs. This list becomes a kind of a, rep a heuristic representation of the content on that page. It's a nice sort of quirky little way that does pretty effective summarization of, of the content. Um, and then we can do this uh, and convert these into our universal IDs. And that becomes important because when we move into the hyperlingual space, now we have our ID representations on all of our different languages. So we have the chocolate page in English, the chocolate page in Hebrew, the chocolate page in Spanish. And we can begin to use this as a way to assess subconcept or page content diversity. Uh, and the way that we do this uh, is pretty, pretty simple. We use um, in what's called an overlap coefficient. This is used a lot in folksonomies and, and tagging uh, vocabularies. Uh, and just to translate that for those of you that um, aren't so quick, it's the size of the intersection of the link sets over the size of the smaller link set. Right? And I'll walk you through a brief example of how this works. So let's imagine we have chocolate page in English and the chocolate page in Hebrew. <coughs> we see that all, all four of the pages linked to in the Hebrew also exist in the English. In this case, we'd have 4 over 4, and the overlap coefficient would be 1. What this means is 100% of the articles linked to on the smaller page are present in the larger page. Um, let's take as another example Spanish. So here we have six things linked to on the Spanish page, but only two of them exist in the English. We get an overlap coefficient of uh, 0.33, which basically says that 33% of the information being linked to from the smaller page exists on the larger page. Right, so we have this method for developing an overlap coefficient to give us some indication of the amount of diversity that's happening at the subpage or the, uh, the body of the article. And what we see uh, overall is that we have a mean overlap coefficient of 0.41. So this is saying that. Um, Essentially, 59% on average, 59% of the links on the smaller page um, aren't being covered by the links on the larger page. Right? So this is pretty compelling to say that we're having pretty big differences here. So everything left of this line is even more extreme. Um, there are some cases where we have pretty good coverage. Right? So it's, it's not as compelling or as clear as the, the first instance I think I showed you. But it still shows as a way of us to kind of assess and measure the, the amount of diversity that's there. So I think here we're going to say that the information on the one page in English is not necessarily the same as it is in the, in the, the larger page, or Spanish versus English in this case for, for chocolate. So here we would also, I would argue, we have not much support for this global consensus hypothesis, but much more support for global diversity. So everybody with me so far? Okay. So then the next thing that we want to do is we want to think about, um, from a research perspective, OK, th and this gets to John's point a little bit. You've shown that these different pages maybe exist or don't exist in certain languages. You've shown that some of the content is different across them. But what really is it about that content that's different? And what kinds of things are, are being pulled out? Uh, and in, so in this third study, what we really wanted to do was we were looking at something that is known in geography as the, the um, Tobler's first law. So his Tobler's first law basically says that things that are close uh, are related, but things that or things that uh, Everything in the world is related, but things that are close are more related. Right? So it's this notion of um, things that we have around us are going to be more related than things are, are sort of further away, and they're going to be more meaningful to us. So this is a little bit to John's Lichtenstein point. Right? And so we want to, in this study, examine as a potential source of this subconcept diversity the degree to which the language um, Based, uh, the degree to which the language-based cultures center their descriptions and their references on entities that exist in a regional context. And I really like this example from The New Yorker. Have people seen this before? So this is The New Yorker's view of the world. right? And so this is The New Yorker. This is Wendy, who's <laughs> spent a lot of time in New York, standing at 9th Avenue. And she can then see 10th Avenue. And there's a whole bunch of detail kind of Everything like here close by. <laughs> you get to 9th and the Hudson is kind of like Right, kind of the a mish. The then you have the Hudson River. You have this little sliver of Jersey, which is like not so nice. And then Chicago, fortunately for me, makes the map. LA does, but sorry, San Diego, you didn't quite get there. Uh, Pacific Ocean, Japan, China, Russia. 
right? So as you get further and further away, you get less information and less kind of regional context. And so what we wanted to do was, was test if this was something that was happening in these different language editions. Uh, and the way that we're going to do this is, is we, we use some techniques from geographic information sciences to allow us to assess this. So a lot of Wikipedia pages are, are geotagged. Uh, so if you look at a, at a Wikipedia page, it has <coughs> there's a whole user group that's really, really adamant about putting in accurate um, latitude and longitude. Do we have any of you in the audience? Now, any geocachers in the audience? Because I know you're basically the same person. We're all at the beach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess you're all at the beach. So we have Sorry, we have the latitudes the and longitude. Of the this origin of the page. No, this is the location of the entity being represented on the page. Okay. So it would be a place, a place or uh, an entity that has a spatial uh, element to it, right? And so this is the location of that. So you get into some problems of like if a state, they often use the centroid, right, as kind of the the metric of it. And we've written some papers on what that level of fidelity means for the interpretations you can make. Um, but I'm going to kind of gloss over that for, <laughs> for now. Um, so, but what we have is around 9 million geotagged articles in the multilingual Wikipedias, um, around 217 million links, and 15 different Wikipedia language editions that we did. And you can see here, you get pretty good global coverage. Um, obviously, it leans a little bit more towards highly populous areas, but there, there are pages that are representing entities pretty much around the world that, that serve as part of this corpus. So what we do is we use a technique called spatial in-degree sums. And so the way that this works is you can define any boundary you want. You basically have a geometry or a, a boundary that you're interested in looking at. So in this case, we're going to think of Poland as the boundary. Um, and then you have entities or pages that exist within those regions. So we have Szczecin and Warsaw as two cities within Poland. Uh, and then what a spatial in-degree sum is going to do is it's going to look across the whole Wikipedia and it's going to find all of the different pages that link to entities that exist within this spatial domain. Right? So in this case, we have things like Pope John Paul II linking into Wars having a link to Warsaw. Um, we have the Hebrew language linking into Warsaw. Um, Red Army and, and Stetchen are, are, are linked. Um, and what we can then do is we do a, a sum over all of the entities that are related to this geographic space. So in the Polish Wikipedia, if these were the entities that linked in, we'd have an in-degree sum of eight. Right? Now what we can do from the multilingual perspective is we can do the same thing, only now we're going to see it with English. And we'll see that there's many less things that are linking into the entities within this space. And we would calculate an in-degree sum for Poland of two. Right? So this just gives us a way to measure the amount of focus that is going on to entities that reside within a particular geographic domain. Um, and if we want to think about this from kind of a hypothesis form, <laughs> the global consensus hypothesis would say that these in-degree sums should be roughly equivalent, and the distribution of them should be roughly equivalent across all Wikipedia versions. Right? So that would be basically saying this information isn't represented in a regionally or locally different way. Uh, the global diversity perspective would say that each language's Wikipedia will have higher in-degree sums in the countries where that language is prominent. Right? So we're expecting um, a, a shift of focus to the different regions where that language is prominent across the different language editions. And it's easier to show these um, as, as um, maps as opposed to big tables of numbers. So what we have here, we use um, what's known as Jenks natural breaks. And essentially, the dark red is going to be the one with the highest in-degree sums, and then uh, breaks that are um, minimize the, uh, maximize the sort of within category differences and, and maximize across, across category distinctions. Um, but so this is the Polish Wikipedia we're looking at. According to the Polish Wikipedia, Poland is the most important European country in the world for all. And remember, this is not just for <coughs> spatial entities. This is for all content in the Polish Wikipedia. It relates more to everything that exists in Poland than to any other country. And we see this at a, at a world level as well, too, at a global level. right? So it's even more important than the mighty United States with all of its people and all of its things to see, like Disneyland uh, and any other kind of countries around the world. We can do the same thing then across all these language editions. So that's Poland. This is Russia. We could do a geography test at this point. Um, this is the English Wikipedia. So now we're seeing a lot of the focus is being put onto entities that reside within, within the US. And the UK is really important as well, too. And the rest of the world is basically meaningless, right? <laughs> Um, and then Japan is probably the most stark, actually. The Japanese Wikipedia, it, almost everything represented in there is related to Japanese entities. Um, so what we're seeing here is a big reflection of the cultural kind of biases that are present in the information, or 
probably what I would argue is sort of more meaningful is that in order for that information to be useful, it's better for it to relate to things that you know about. And so these are the intended communities of consumption. And so they're relating this information to these local contexts. And that poses a really huge challenge for straight translation. Right? Because if translation brings across a bunch of entities that you don't know and you're not aware of, you're not actually going to be able to make too much sense of that information. Right? So this is why it's a, a challenge for computer science. Um, and so another way to think about this is let's use a concrete example. We could think about the page on the Empire State Building. And in English, it would link to things like the Willis Tower, the Sears Tower in Chicago. It would link to American architects, things like that. You could take the same entity. You could take the Empire State Building in, in French. And it would link to the Eiffel Tower. And it would link to Parisian and French architects. Right? So that's this local and regional contextualization that makes the information useful to these end user communities. Um, we can also do this at several different scales. So this is the US looking at the same thing. Congratulations, California. You are the most important state in the US relative to the English Wikipedia. High five over there. Saw it. Um, <laughs> and the interesting thing is, anybody know what this is here? Oh my god. I am in California. I'm like way over here. Ontario? Ontario. Yes. So this is Ontario, right? And this is the English Wikipedia. Now I'm going to jump to the French Wikipedia. And suddenly another area becomes much more important. What is this? Quebec. Quebec. There we go. Right? So this is the Quebecois. And, and much more of the focus goes on to entities within uh, the Quebec area. So we see that the information being represented is being regionalized and contextualized in, like really, in what I would argue is really important ways. Okay. So self-focus is a systematic bias. For better or worse, it's a systematic bias in the information representation. And what's happening is people are orienting the knowledge around themselves. So what I want to do for the next few minutes is, is demonstrate what this potential coverage bias, the effect it can have on some of our existing technologies. Uh, and to do this, I want to focus on um, one technology in particular, um, which I'll describe in a second, which is uh, a way to calculate relatedness between entities. But to give you an idea of what it is we're trying to do, we want to <coughs> examine whether the implications of this diversity, um, what it will be on sort of AI and NLP systems that make use of single language data structures, such as the Wikipedia uh, data structures. And it's, this is, again, this is a, a very common uh, technique to use. Wikipedia gives us things like uh, common entities that we had problems with before, right? So we don't have a big knowledge base of things like Britney Spears or Barack Obama and the fact that Barack, you know, lived in Hyde Park and Hyde Park has these great hot dog places. Like that was really hard information to get to our AI systems that people are harvesting Wikipedia for uh, as a source of world knowledge. Um, so what we want to ask is if we see these technologies with different language additions, do we get a similar or different output? Um, just to sort of beat you over the head with this, the global consensus would basically say, regardless of the language we put into the system, we get similar outputs. Uh, a global diversity perspective would say, we'll get very different outputs depending on whether we seed it with English, German, Spanish, French, and so on and so forth. Okay. So our goals in doing this were to demonstrate that the effect that global diversity of Wikipedia might have on these um, technologies that use a single language edition as their sole source of world knowledge, uh, and determine whether the output is biased towards that worldview. Okay. So the test technology, one of the ones that we use in some of the papers, is, is called explicit semantic analysis. This is um, a really widely cited paper by Gabrilovich and Markovich from 2007. And semantic relatedness essentially tells you how related two items are. Right? So we want to know how related is bread and peanut butter. Uh, and we put those two entities in, and we get some value out between 0 and 1, 0 being there's no relationship, 1 being there's a great relationship between the two. Um, to put this in more of a local context, and this is actually a good example because it'll uh, let you understand how these rankings can be different based on culture, what would happen if we thought about how related is a fish and a taco? Uh, and I would argue that in San Diego, you're going to get a number much greater or closer to one than you would get in the central plains of the US right? or even other places around the world. So that this, this relationship is, is culturally uh, specified and culturally meaningful at some level. And okay. I, you know, I searched for a while, and then I was like, but I can't do a fish taco because then it's a fish to a fish taco. So I just needed a general concept of a taco. Okay. Uh, so what we're gonna do in this evaluation is we're gonna seed the ESA. Uh, we 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 developed a uh, explicit semantic analysis. Um, technology or uh, algorithm for, for us that works with multiple different languages. We're going to seed it with 
uh, English, and we're going to look at the relationship between concept pairs. We'll do that for English, we'll do it for German, we'll do it for Spanish, and so on and so forth. And the question we're asking is, does the output in the relationship of entities vary depending on the language uh, that's seeded into this technology? Right? So what's the relationship between bread and peanut butter uh, if we expect equivalence uh, or do we expect differences here? So we did this for 2,000 different concept pairs across 10 languages. And essentially what we would expect is if global diversity were not an issue here, um, these columns would essentially be um, strongly correlated. Right? We'd expect that the results across these concept pairs are pretty similar when we're comparing English to French, German to French, German to English, so on and so forth. Okay. And what we see is that the overall correlation between them is only 0.18. So the output that you get from these systems is very, very different depending on what is getting put into them, right? Because of the cultural biases that are present in the Wikipedia data structures that are, are put into these uh, technologies. And the outlier is um, something? Yeah, no, so the, the, this outlier actually comes from two Scandinavian countries, oh. Sweden and Finnish. No, sorry, uh, Norwegian and Swedish. So that yeah. R value is basically the odds that fish links to taco uh, in another language of Wikipedia? Nope. That correlation is the odds that fish links to taco has the same correlation yeah. Yeah. between English and German, right? So it's a, it's a correlation of correlations, which yeah. is a little bit uh, difficult to think about. But yeah, it's, it's that, map, that joint mapping between the two. And we're showing that as those diverge, this will get smaller. As they sort of move in tandem, it'll get, it'll get higher. So here we see, again, uh, mostly support for this sort of notion of global diversity. Um, and this is uh, a serious concern for Wikipedia-based technologies, things like semantic relatedness, or when we do information retrieval or topic clustering, uh, and uh, lots of technologies in information retrieval that use this as a resource. Um, so for instance, we've looked at things like um, doing search and retrieval. You put in World War II as the entity, and you look at the ranked list of things that come back. And in the English Wikipedia, uh, or in the German Wikipedia, carpet bombing is a very highly ranked entity when it comes back. It has a high amount of relatedness to, to World War II, and that's because that was the atrocity committed against the Germans in that war, whereas when you look at other languages, it's much further down the list. So we begin to see that these cultural distinctions can actually come through and play out in the results that we're getting from the technologies. And so what we can't do, and what most computer science techno technologies <coughs> using this do, is they take English because it's the biggest, they seed it into these technologies, they get their output, and then they translate. And so what's happened then is you've embedded those cultural biases into the output that you're getting from the technologies. So we need to actually be thinking about this earlier on in, the, in that cycle. Um, but I don't want to just complain about things. I also think we have an opportunity here for designing and developing what I'm, I'm arguing are culturally aware technologies. So to try to think about new types of technologies we can um, that make use of this diversity of representations. Just a quick yep. question. Um, so as you may know, um, the Watson system that IBM developed uh, did a lot of digesting of English Wikipedia information. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you looked at uh, you know things like technical content or you know um, yep. medical knowledge. And yeah. Because obviously, if you're trying to distill knowledge and then share it across the world, yep. you'd like to know that at least in more technical domains, things <laughs> are not quite as Are less easy, subjective. Are, not, are less diverse. Yes. Uh, and so we're actually working on a, a journal article right now where one of the things that we do is we break it up by, so Wikipedia has a nice ontology and category, category structure. And we see that things like mathematics and some of those more, what we would expect to be more objective areas, are, are have more kind of coverage and are sort of globally cohesive. Uh, and it's, it's all of this other kind of more culturally significant information, like that where you get these big deviations and these big differences. Um, but you still see it in examples when, they, when they're sort of worked examples that are trying to use entities that are outside of that cultural context. Yeah. So from a learning, yeah, in a learning perspective, <laughs> the word problems are, are problematic. Yeah. And just, I, I just make one other quick comment, which I don't know what to make of this yet, but I know that when we built an enhanced audio conferencing system and we actually did an analysis of conference calls, uh -huh. it turned out that the single most frequent use of a conference calling system was a single person on the line. And that was a surprise, <laughs> right? That's uh -huh. weird. And I think, you know, our conclusion was that it was people calling in at the wrong time, calling in and waiting for others, right? The mm -hmm. most conference minutes were a single user. So my point being, I'm not really sure how that relates to your graph. <laughs> I'm not sure either, quite honestly. No, but. I, it's not at all. <laughs> I, but, but I mean, 
the point there is that a conference calling system, you think of it, and its actual utility is when there's more than one person, even yep. though it turns out that's not the most frequent thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think you really do have to look closely at the uh, yes. usage, the yep. utility of why you're getting so mm -hmm. many one one off. Yep. And and so um, that's a that's a and really it may good not point. Undermine the whole idea of a right. And it actually doesn't, because we've looked we've looked at that in a lot of detail. And there's a whole lot of those single language ones are are things that are, I would argue, are very relevant uh, kinds of topics in some of those ways. And in fact, we've done an analysis where we we look at we basically can build a network graph where things that are central are the highly visited sites. So we basically look at it by consumption, and we see almost the same amount of of this a very similar pattern of diversity for very highly central kinds of articles. So things that are being consumed a lot still have the same property. Um, so this has a lot of implications for Wikipedia readers. Uh, there's a major challenge here, which is that we have siloed information due to these different language barriers. But um, we also wanted to think about this as a potential opportunity, right? Uh, we have a huge repository of diverse world knowledge, and that actually could be quite meaningful if we can get it into the right context and into the right form for people to consume. Um, so with that, we developed a system called Omnipedia. And what this does is it provides access to over 8 million different concepts in 25 different language editions simultaneously. Uh, and it highlights similarities and differences between language editions. So here's where we're trying to think about what are technologies that are culturally sensitive, culturally aware, or that sort of highlight these differences as opposed to treating them as bugs and trying to sort of come up with the best optimal solution. Um, so the way that Omnipedia works is this. You put in the page or the, the topic you're interested in. We're going to use conspiracy theory. Um, it then you pick all the languages that you want to work in, and currently it works with up to 25 different language editions. Uh, and then we get um, this immediately, which for those of you that do viz might be a little bit scary. Um, but what this shows you is each of these nodes is an entity that's mentioned on the page in conspiracy theory for a given language. So this is all of the unique content that's mentioned on the English page, all the unique content on the German page, Spanish page, so on and so forth. So just at a glance, we get a really big indication of the different information on these different um, language editions <coughs> in Chinese. And then you can actually hover over the nodes. And this basically says, sorry for those of you in the back, the progress of the SARS outbreak. So that's only mentioned on the Chinese page on conspiracy theory. Um, Hebrew similarly mentions Fatah in its conspiracy theory page. Uh, and one of my favorites, the Microsoft <laughs> Windows, uh, that's being represented on the, the Hebrew Wikipedia page. And what we do then, and this is the only place where we actually do translation, we do snippet extraction. So when you select on that node, um, it will actually pull out. We do a, a little bit of smarts to find what the most relevant thing is. And we do a little bit of translation on that so you can read it in the end user's uh, language. And really what this is is this notion that Microsoft Windows into every operating system puts in some hidden code. And anytime the US decides they want to go to war with any country in the Middle East, uh, the current president calls up whoever the head of Microsoft is at the time and says, we're going. They flip a switch and down go all the systems. Right? So it's, a, <laughs> it's on the conspiracy theory page as a, as a way that the US is engaging in cyber warfare that you only see in the Hebrew Wikipedia page. So we can also go through and we can see all the languages, uh, all the things in two languages, in three languages, and so on and so forth. Um, as you zoom in, you can then begin to see what are global concepts, right? So now we think about what's on conspiracy, what's being described in the conspiracy theory page across lots of different languages. And we see a lot of things I think we might expect here, right? What, those of you in the back, name something. What's a global conspiracy that we would expect? 9 11? Yeah, so September 11 attacks right there. Other ones? The moon landing, right there, moon landing conspiracy theories. Other ones? Elvis. <laughs> Elvis. I don't see Elvis, but I bet he's on there somewhere. Uh, JFK is, is another one, right? So we see JFK, Freemasonry, uh, the Cold War, a lot of different things that are being mentioned on multiple different pages about conspiracy theory. So what this allows us to do is to, to get an idea of the, the information that's globally represented and the stuff that's kind of unique to different, different um, topics. Uh, and so then again, on these global concepts, you can click on moon landing conspiracy theories. We do extraction across the different languages. So now you have a contextual way to sort of read about the representation to see if that subconcept level kind of descriptions are different or, or kind of similar. Right? So this is our, our way of, of giving access to that. Um, and then the last thing that you can do uh, is you can pick different language sets. So if you're interested in just looking at you know, World War II, World War I languages, Scandinavian languages, Eastern European languages, linguists love this because they can actually go through and pick apart different language sets that they're interested in looking at. Um, 
And then just to show that we eat our own dog food, we also allow you to sort of switch the interface to any language that you want. So now you're seeing the representation from Spanish, right? So it's, everything is presented in Spanish. And we actually get this for free because of the use of the interlanguage link graph. So when we switch a language, we just kind of automatically get it across the board. <coughs> um, do I have, how are we on time? I have a couple more minutes? Yeah, we got about 10 minutes, including questions. Oh, OK. So I, I'll just go through this briefly. So we also um, did a deployment, or kind of a local deployment of, of Omnipedia, and, and actually ran an internal user study uh, where we had about 27 different users. We used primarily native English speakers, but also some Rus Russian and Chinese and a couple of bilinguals. Um, and we gave them 10 minute dem demo on how to use Omnipedia, gave them 30 minutes of free use, and then uh, did a 20 minute interview afterwards to see just kind of how they were using this and how they were kind of understanding it. Um, and a couple of patterns that came out in the data, the users sought out information that was unique to one language edition. So we had one uh, woman who came in and she wanted to know whether one culture's view of a certain aspect of beauty uh, made it, maybe existed that she didn't know about. So she put in beauty and then she looked and she saw that in Japanese there was a discussion about Latin and when you look at this it's, it's a description of how the Japanese language treats beauty differently than traditional Latin and Greek views on, on beauty. Uh, and then she went over to English and she saw things like lookism, which is essentially racism that's based on looks. Good looking people get, get more. Uh, they have better, easier times in life. They get paid more. There's actually quite a bit of uh, data that suggests some of that. Um, and then facial symmetry. And so what she noted was the English basis uh, is much more about s physical structure and physical being. And the, the Japanese is much more about things like nature and other types of sort of innate beauty that aren't necessarily surface details. Um, other users investigated um, stereotypes. So this one looked, he said, uh, I know Siemens has always gotten a lot of flack for supporting the Nazi movement in World War II. And I wanted to see if German, the German Wikipedia would go into that in depth. So here he had a hypothesis that they wouldn't. He thought that that would not be information that was represented there. But in fact, when you, he searched for Siemens, you see there's actually a great deal of unique German content. That's the, the yellow. Uh, and in fact, there's a, a piece I didn't show you, which is that you can, using semantic relatedness, you can search for any entity and get it highlighted uh, kind of throughout the rest of the system. Um, he saw that um, it's actually discussed quite a bit on the German Wikipedia, and it talks about how Siemens became one of the largest organizations on the basis of all of the things that they were building in the World War II war efforts. Right? So he was surprised to see that actually that information was being represented um, in the German Wikipedia. Um, some users were just interested in what was well known worldwide. So instead of looking at the single language, they swung to just look at those global concepts. Uh, and so this person says, I'd simply swing over and look at how all these languages overlap. And they found that to be sort of the most compelling use case. Uh, and then we had some that just said things like, uh, I was, it was ridiculous how many different uh, things are mentioned in different languages uh, that aren't mentioned in others. And I think this was really nice validation for what we were trying to do. We're trying to give people access to all of the world's information, kind of like Wikipedia was intended to do, but to also allow them to see a more nuanced version of that data. Okay, so just in summary, what these participants did was they discovered information unique to a single language. They investigated a bunch of stereo different stereotypes. They identified the most global aspects of a given concept. Uh, and they realized the magnitude of content that wasn't available to them in the single language edition. Uh, and so where are we going with, with Omnipedia? Right now we're doing two things. We're using it to, to try to uncover how people have insights how they develop new insights in these, in these representations. And so we actually have outfitted Omnipedia with a bunch of tracking software that allows us to try to automatically infer when somebody learns a new insight uh, and see if we can, we can learn something deeper about that. Uh, and we're also building it out for a large scale deployment um, working with Google so that we can launch this and, and do a real large scale, wide scale uh, deployment of the technology. Um, so just to kind of summarize here, uh, I want to first showed, I think, um, the first part of this, which was empirical work to demonstrate the great deal of diversity that exists across the different Wikipedia language editions. Um, we showed this exists at both the concept and subconcept level, and a lot of it has to do with regionalization and localization of that content. Uh, we then showed how this bias can influence technologies, in particular explicit semantic analysis. Uh, and then finally, I showed you Omnipedia, which is what we're thinking of as a new approach to designing um, social technologies that retain and make salient these different perspectives and these different views on the information. Uh, and then just to close, I would be completely remiss if I didn't mention my two graduate students that worked on this, both of which note have a PhD after their name. So Brent Hecht, who is absolutely wonderful and did a lot of the back end work on this system. He's now a professor at the University of Minnesota in computer science. And Patty Bao, who recently graduated, and she's working at Google as a, as a researcher. Uh, and if you're interested in the papers, um, here's uh, four of them that we had uh, drawn a fair amount of this work from. So with that, happy to take more questions. Okay.
just wondering the effect for uh, smaller countries. I saw you mentioned Denmark a couple of times. That's where uh -huh. you're from. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we use lots of single language, <laughs> language concepts on our wiki because our wiki is terribly, terribly small. We pretty much rely on the, the English version for everything mm -hmm. already. So there's lots of concepts we don't bother translating. Yeah. Yeah, kind of use it anyway. Yeah, so Denmark's a really interesting case, right? Because you actually have a higher English literacy rate than the US. Um, <laughs> congratulations, Denmark. Um, so you actually, I mean, it's interesting. So, so the, the Danish, and one of the things we've been doing is we've been trying to do some studies, more qualitative studies, where we're going around and like trying to interview people around the world who are editors for these and people who are consumers and users of them to see how they use these in tandem. And I think your case is a very interesting one where uh, because of the high literacy rate in English, you can go to English and you can consume it and you can get the information. And so the Danish is basically for purely Danish kinds of things, right? Things that either sort of stand out or that are, are regional to the point that they might not make it into the English Wikipedia. And so it's, it's an actually, it's an interesting case and it's one of the ones that stands out a little bit more from some of the other language editions because I think I would argue both it's, it's high fluency in English uh, and it's sort of smaller scale and smaller size, yeah. Yep. Um, in one of your earlier slides, you had a uh, picture of the different concepts that were universal across different languages. So uh -huh. there was IBM, Sharp, Alien, those sorts of things. Uh -huh. And overall, I felt like those were more things that entered languages more recently overall. So do you look at time as a predictor of um, cross uh, we haven't. That's a great point, though. I should. I, we should certainly do that. So almost like. Yep. Yep. And and so there's two things I think you're saying. One is is sort of the recency of the entities themselves, right? So common events, more recent events. Yeah. And so that that would be a good way. We haven't really cut the data that way. The thing that we have done is we've taken a time slice in 2009, a time slice in 2010, and a recent time slice in 2012. And we've looked at this, and basically what you're, what some people would propose is that English is this big one, and every, everything else is going to catch up to it. But everything's been growing at a pretty, pretty similar rate, uh, and these distributions are pretty much the same that we're seeing, just kind of growing overall. So we're still seeing the same kind of differentials happening, uh, but growth is pretty is pretty equivalent across the, the different systems. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're kind of making an assumption that. Um, Language is a proxy for you know kind of cultural country yep. or something like that, and of course going from Switzerland, <laughs> like you know we don't have a Swiss language and we yeah. speak four languages. It's a it's a small kind of country, so it doesn't really count. But I'm thinking about that. So English, you know, it's it's spoken in many different countries, mm -hmm. uh, and most of them very different kind of cultural, um, you know, cultural environment and cultural kind of kind of roots and stuff like yep. that. So is there any way you can actually capture also these nuances of the same language but coming from different kind of cultures? Yeah, and so this is what we argue in, in one of our earlier papers. We talk about language has this fracturing effect, but it also, within a language, it has this sort of winner rules property to it, right? And so the unfortunate thing about that is we don't have a way for English, the English Wikipedia, to represent the views of, say, Australia or Canada or other maybe smaller countries that use that as a predominant language. And then the other, the flip side of that, or not really the flip side of that, but another challenge we have are, are places like, like Switzerland and Belgium where you have multilingual people uh, and maybe not a, a, a large corpus that's in their particular uh, language domain. And so it's a really tricky problem. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a, a good solution for it. I, I agree, though, that that's, that's a major challenge there. And so, I mean, one of the things that I'm very interested in and in just thinking about um, systems to represent information are building new faceted ways to have different views on, on the, either the same data or slightly different views on that data. Right? So there's a really interesting thing out there called Conservapedia. Has anyone ever looked at Conservapedia? Um, Conservapedia is really interesting, right? It's, yeah, we have one, one hand up in the back. Uh, it has things on it like Barack Obama's birth certificate. Um, being in a, you know, basically claiming Barack was, was born in a, in a different land than the United States. Uh, it has a very different kind of representation. And so, so Conservapedia was basically a splinter group that broke off of Wikipedia because they said that Wikipedia was uh, representing information with a liberal left-wing bias, too much of a liberal left-wing bias. And so they splintered off and developed their own kind of Wikipedia. And so Wikipedia doesn't want this, right? They want kind of consensus and neutral point of view on the information that's being presented. But that's a, a real challenge, especially when you have minority viewpoints, when you have different cultural perspectives. And I don't think we know what to do with that yet. We don't really know. 
uh, a way to, to think about that. But that's one of the things we were trying to do with Omnipedia was to, to push at least a little bit at that and say, let's start thinking about technologies that have that level of nuance or have facets to it that allow you to see slightly different perspectives or different information representations. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a really good question. I don't have a good answer, uh, but it's a, it's a big challenge for us. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you.